Um, thank you, Edward. Yes, I like the vote of confidence. I, I'm sure my data presentation is going to be a lot more sophisticated than anything <laughs> planning is capable of. Um, it's great to see everyone. We're really excited to be breaking out in committees this week. Uh, just a reminder that um, this committee meeting, uh, as with all of our meetings, is, is the Metro website. So for anyone who's tuning into this, thank you for your interest. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, we're all excited about the work we're doing. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to share some meaningful professional news. Um, uh, namely Dia, uh, who we all know has this week transitioned uh, from working at the Public Health Department where she was uh, on point on doing work around decriminalizing criminal justice. Uh, she's come over to the mayor's office and she is now a senior policy analyst uh, for Mayor Cooper. Um, we worked very closely on the Policing Policy Commission. She was uh, really the architect of that process. In addition to her health chops, she also has more than two decades of experience uh, working uh, in the great state of Illinois in public policy, doing community engagement and many other things. So we've already benefited from her expertise and I'm just really happy to have her as a colleague. Um, this is gonna be a great process and there's lots more work to be done. So congratulations, Dia. So happy to have you uh, formally in the mayor's office. And I want to turn things over to you to get started. Sounds good. Thanks, John, for the introduction. Um, not sure I should say thank you since you're taking up my Thursday night, but oh well, them's the shakes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, what we're going to do today is, or this evening, is uh, we're, we're going to um, move things around a little bit. Uh, we had hoped to come to you with program data, data around um, the Barnes Fund, Litex, Section 8. That All that good data is nearly complete, but we're going to move that to next week's meeting. Um, so this week's meeting is really a good opportunity to finish out the discussion around um, the market conditions and population accountability. Um, Greg Claxton, of course, is at the Planning Commission tonight, so he can't be with us. Um, but he, um, we have focused on three of his slides, and I'm going to put up there. And John, if you're if you're up for it, um, happy to have you, um, you know, guide us on this tour. We're um, really, um, oh, and let me just say before I forget. Um, so tonight we're going to dive into the market conditions. Um, and we're going to swap the agenda. We're going to do the selection of chair and vice chair at the end of the meeting. Um, and so we will get there. Um, but it seemed to make most sense just to dive in here, particularly around all the energy that existed uh, last week around the discussion on market, market conditions. Um, so Greg teed up three slides for us um, to really set up the discussion around you know, the big result we're after and how to begin to talk about um, factors that both restrict and contribute to the creation of affordable housing units. John, you want to take us away? Absolutely, yes. So uh, the first slide will be familiar to, um, to all of you from last week. And just to sort of pause and, and sort of call out the notable trend. So when we look at this slide and think about the nature of the challenge, um, what really, one thing that really stands out is if we look at that last column, it says percentage growth to 20, 2019, you know, what we see is uh, considerable growth um, at the lower end of the median annual wage spectrum and at the upper end and a much more stagnant position sort of middle segment in that 30,000 to 70,000 segment. Um, so we're seeing, you know, high end growth, still quite a small number of jobs, 12% of 2019 jobs, kind of, uh, uh, you know, stagnant growth in that middle income and then quite significant amount of growth in that low income. Uh, population group. And so clearly that is going to be a challenge for us going forward. And what Greg and Nick 
uh, and his team have been working on is um, they have taken the data um, that was really first developed back in 2017 by EPS when they did their evaluation and they're updating that for current conditions. And this is kind of preliminary what comes next. Uh, Greg and Nick think they'll have a more complete picture for us next week. To give us a first look on this next slide, I think they focused, if I remember correctly, on just on sort of the rental supply gap. And um, as you can all see, um, you know, the, the, the need there uh, is really concentrated, you know, below 50% uh, of, of AMI, uh, a little bit below 60%. Um, and that, of course, um, sort of tracks the fact that there's been a lot of growth in that among those lower wage jobs. And um, we'll have sort of more complete data on that by, by next week. Um, but that's probably a, a challenge that doesn't surprise very many of you. Moving on to um, our final slide. This is quite preliminary. So I believe yesterday, uh, Jeremy Haight from THDA uh, shared uh, a lot of preliminary information on what our current um, subsidized uh, housing world looks like. And you can see over on the right, um, MDHA properties and non-MDHA properties. This is, is still quite preliminary. It really includes the THDA data, uh, but planning hasn't had a chance to sort of pull in Barnes data or LIHTC information. We're hoping to have a more complete picture um, by uh, tomorrow. Um, However, this gives you a very sort of preliminary sense of what the needs are. So hopefully we, next Thursday we'll move from preliminary to something much more definite. Uh, THCA data were really great. And at the meeting this morning, there was a lot of uh, discussion about um, sort of data, you know, what we need to know, and that'll be part of the exercise that we do later today as well. What did I forget, Dia? I think that looks good. Um, you know, I, I just wanna flag that, of course, the supply gap uh, slide here does show us an owner gap as well, given that this committee is focused on um, new construction, um, you know, I think that this is a, an important piece of information um, as, you know, we see this growing. Um, and I think the expectation is that uh, if we were to look at a forecast, um, given that we do nothing, it would continue to grow. Um, so, and I think we can see that here in the 15 year period between the, in the renter gap itself um, as it's it's grown pretty phenomenally um, below 60% AMI. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is turn to our discussion tonight. I'm gonna ask Edward, um, because of our um, virtual environment, um, that uh, if he could, as we start to do our work together tonight, if he would be so kind as to serve as our moderator and call on individuals as they raise their hands. Um, so what you should be seeing before you, um, so I will let Edward <laughs> guide me on this to, to verify that you're seeing um, a form, a table that says affordable housing task force, uh, the creation committee. Um, and um, up on the top, what we should be looking at is, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about that the big goal that this task force is after is Nashville housing options are affordable, available, and accessible to all working Nashvillians. Um, and what we just looked at were some baseline indicators around supply gap um, in terms of the owner and renter gaps. 
the current rental availability, and then the future subsidized units. So we just we just looked at that information. Um, are you all seeing my um, table um, here? Is it coming through? I believe, yeah, I believe we all are. I do want to just before we before we dive in, I want to recognize that um, Dr. Shin has a hand raised, and I don't know if that was because there was a question specific to the slides. Uh, on the third slide, on the right-hand panel, how is affordability defined? Affordable to who? Third slide, right-hand panel. Uh, the committee of inventory units. of current affordable units. Is that affordable below 80%, below 30%? Affordable to whom? That is a great question. And... Um, and I do not have that answer, but we can certainly get that to verify. I just and my, out that the gap we, is lowest, the gap is largest for our lowest income uh, neighbors. Yeah, I think that's yeah. an important point. And one of the things that I think we wanna keep in mind is my understanding is typically this is 80% of AMI, but I will verify that. And I think what we can see is if we do nothing on this trend line on the right, that it creates a downward pressure if we are considering 80% and 80% of AMI and beneath that. So, uh, you know, I just, I do think it's, it's a pretty stark forecast and, and keep in mind that this forecast really presumes that um, expiring credits will not be expanded and it presumes that um, all expiring um, uh, product will be sold at market rate. Now, obviously that doesn't happen, but, you know, if we were to do nothing, there's really no incentive for folks to keep um, these subsidies uh, in these properties. So, um, so I just, you know, I just want to caution that this is a, if we do nothing forecast. And Dr. Shane, we'll get an answer on that. This could also be a total tally of subsidized units. I think that's one, that's one thing they could be trying to to show here what does the entire subsidized uh, supply look like yeah thanks and I, it would be useful to see what it looks like if it's really at the bottom where the inventory and the gap is the largest that's a great point and we will see if we can cut the data um uh looking at that at the uh, lowest ami so i'm just writing a quick note any other quick questions on the data all righty. I'm ready when you are, Dia. <laughs> Sounds good. I appreciate it, Edward. So what we see is the big goal. Uh, we're measuring that big goal by the current three data points or four data points that we were just looking at. And what you see on the left are factors restricting the creation of units below 80% AMI. The list on the left comes from the activity that we did starting two weeks ago. Um, so what I'd like for all of you to do is just take a look at the list and see if there's anything else we have to add that would be important as part of the story behind the data. Right now, we just wanna know what's going on in the data as we know it. Um, we might need more data and there will be a place tonight to, to add those items as, as Dr. Shin has indicated. Um, so, what's in the list from the last activity is there are no appropriate incentives for for profit developers. The private sector role is undefined. The cyclical, the cyclical nature of funding is inflexible to emerging deals. Local residents do not have access to funds like outside investors. There are state law limitations uh, in terms of tax abatements to LIHTC and the ban on inclusionary zoning. Pilots are inconsistently applied. And there are limitations of the Barnes Fund, no dedicated or adequate funding source. So if you were to add any other factors restricting the creation of units below 80% AMI, what would you add to that? So really quick, I see that Dr. Coleman is stuck in the attendees. Could we bring Dr. Coleman in? Um, and then after that, I see a hand first from Dr. Shin, and then I see uh, Kelsey. So, so please just call me Beth. Um, we'll do that. Exclusionary zoning is another important restriction. 
So exclusionary zoning, let's say that you can't build multifamily units, you have to have uh, acreage, certain amount of acreage, uh, and, and the like. Okay, so go ahead now, Kelsey. Um, I think in general, just rising costs, but specifically the cost of land and construction, um, we're just seeing it across the board. And then um, I see Emily Thaden saying. They both stole mine, but I do think we should point out, you know, land is finite, right? So it's not, I mean, obviously that's associated with Kelsey's point about costs, but recognizing that land is finite. See, Gina, I saw your hand pop up. I don't know if you that was on purpose. No, I was gonna okay. um, echo what uh, what Dr. Shin um, had said about exclusionary. Zone. Let's see, I don't. Dr. Dr. Coleman has her hand up, but again, I think she's still an attendee, so I'm not sure if she can unmute herself. Oh, she's now a participant. Dr. Coleman, would you like to weigh in? Well, she might, might still just be having her hand up, but you, Dr. Coleman, you're now an attendee, so you should be able to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? We can saying that there are no appropriate incentives for nonprofit developers as well. The incentive structure is not appropriate for either group and particularly nonprofits. One one that I would I would add Dia I think is you know the the responsiveness or or ability for funding sources to be tapped or utilized quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so even though we do have some programs and some funding sources, they're just not able to respond as quickly as the free market or the private sector. Okay. I think that's a good list. There will be opportunities to um, rank that list and kind of uh, get to a short list. But I think we just want to start with um, a good overview. I'd like to move to factors that contribute to the creation of units. So what is what are some you know factors behind these data that still create units? Well, I will say there's there's a great amount of demand, right? So you have a you have a business case. Um, Dr. Coleman, I see your hand still up. If you wanted to chime in, yes, uh, I think expiring uses uh, creates an opportunity, but more often than not, it is not in terms of affordability. But that does create an opportunity for more units. Yeah, I guess the one thing that might be might be important to highlight. Are we we are while the fact of restriction the creation of units below 80% AMI is the question creation of units with that same um, income restriction? Is that the question we're asking here? Um, yes, I believe so, unless um, members feel there should be another uh, benchmark if you want to go up higher. I just wanted to be sure since it's not in the heading. I just wanted to make that for clarification. Yeah. Um, Emily, I see I see your hands up. Sorry about that. Totally fine. Um, I was just going to say uh, federal programs. So the federal programs and then also our existing pilot.
other factors. I also, I'd also say the, C, the community investment tax credit has been a major tool from the state level. And we could say live tech, but we can include that in federal programs. Okay. We'll separate it out because I know there's more work to be done on that one. Beth, I see your hands up. Amazon uh, <laughs> is making, in principle, money available. We should tap into it. Mm -hmm. I, I will say this, and, and while I, I will be one of the people who somewhat criticize that it's not uniform across all scales, but um, rezoning of parcels to allow for more density of units, you know, I think there are some cases and examples that the city has done a very good job identifying opportunities and working with developers to, to upzone and allow for zoning to uh, allow for more density. Other items? I see okay. your I see your hand again. Um, if you wanted to chime in and then um, yeah. yeah. Tagging onto that rezoning of parcels to allow for more density, I think just really updating the city's overall plan and how we want to do that. And the Nashville Next was quite a while ago, which was the last time that happened. And currently all of the, the studies in the city and policy and where this should happen are quite outdated when you think of 2010 to now. Um, and some of that is really restrictions on the city's ability to do that at a lower state. And so I think coming up with a, a master plan for how that could be done um, would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. I see Emil, uh, I see your hand and then I also see uh, Dr. Coleman after that. I would also add the presence of local nonprofit developers whose mission is solely focused on the creation of new affordable housing. Great. All right. I think that's a good list. Um, again, I saw Hunter's hand. I don't know if Dr. Coleman's hand was just is still up, but I saw Hunter's hand. My hand should not still be up. Okay. Hunter, would you like I to? Had one. Yeah, I was just going to uh, expand upon Emil's uh, one to say that also that We've been pretty blessed to have about uh, 10 or 15 other for-profit um, affordable housing developers that have come into Nashville and, and done several projects. So uh, given the uh, desirability of Nashville, we've had many other for-profit developers come uh, and, and do affordable housing projects in different parts of the city. Edward, let's take one more. Does that sound good? Sure. I don't. I don't see any. I don't see any hands up right now. Uh, Edward, I can't raise my hand because I'm on my ah. phone. Ah. Okay. Yes. Go, Councilwoman, please go ahead. I apologize. Let me say that because I, I, I'm in the point where my studies is sporadic. I may be missing some of the conversation and not even come out clear. So if this is not, um, uh, uh, I apologize in advance. But I'm just looking at factors affecting the creation of affordable housing, uh, uh, not necessarily just the funding part. But I think we cannot talk about that without talking about people not wanting affordable housing in their, in their neighborhood. I think that is, uh, and I don't know if I'm still on, uh, but I think that's one of the factors as well, because sometimes we do have uh, uh, companies that wants to do it, but the neighborhood will be against it. So um, I wanted to add that. I don't know if that's part of what we're talking about, if we're just looking at the fund only or anything. And I apologize, I'm, I'm in and out of uh, uh, connection area. No, you, you, we, we heard you. You cleared up very well towards the back end, and we did um, make note of your comment um, under under the restricting item. So we, we we appreciate that. I do see Emily. Your hand is your hand is still up. If you if you did want to add something before we moved on, 
I think we would just be remiss if we didn't mention the Barnes Fund. You know, that, that is very true. Great point is we talk about a lot of different programs and incentives, um, the Barnes Fund itself and the great work of the Barnes Fund Commission. We have a few more questions to work through, so we're going to keep moving. Um, we can come back to this list uh, at another point if we need to augment it and to prioritize it. I think the next question that I'm interested in hearing um, committee member feedback on is what's happening today to create this data story? Um, you know, as we, we think about sort of current trends and events, you know, sort of what is what is what are behind some of these factors? In addition to um, the pandemic stagnant wages over the past several years play a really important role uh, not uh, in affordability and the story. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about the pandemic. Well, since people don't have jobs, uh, many people have gotten behind in their rents. And even though CDC has had a moratorium, uh, it's being, the enforcement may or may not be as stringent as one would like. And when <clears throat> the moratorium ends, what happens? And that's independent of the fact that wages have been stagnant. And I think we saw somebody had a, a graph of that last week that showed um, the much more steep incline in terms of housing costs versus the almost flat line of wages. Mm -hmm. Kia, I see your I see your hand went up. Yeah, just to, just to um, uh, take that point, I think, a little bit further than Dr. Coleman is talking about, um, to go further and deeper, the racial wealth gap, um, generally, um, and systemic racism and what it, how it has played out uh, federally and locally and today and historically, <laughs> you know, history is today. Um, and so when you look at the fact that um, uh, black individuals are 200, I think, in 14 years behind in the wealth gap, um, it makes it very difficult when the city is really crushing, um, crushing us with the lack of affordable housing. And so that is uh, certainly contributing. So I, I want to make sure that we're not just looking at today, but we're looking at history as a today story as well. No, thank you for that, Kia. Um, if just just as a matter of cutting down on background noise, if you're not speaking, could you please mute for us? And if you would not like to speak, could you lower your hand? Uh, Emily, I see your hand. Would you go ahead, please? Um, I would say uh, insufficient funding, and part of that has been related to you know whether we have adequate property taxes and what our local budget is looking like. I would also add um, just growth in Nashville. This, there's just a lot of increased pressure, right, in the market. And then lastly, I would say um, we, uh, a lack of a commitment to um, permanent affordability and permanent housing. So I think that's true in the homelessness space as well. So we really aren't, uh, we haven't really made a policy commitment uh, to whether it's uh, permanent affordability and making sure when we build it, we keep it. Or, um, you know, when we're thinking about homelessness, going by the empirical research and saying, let's build permanently supportive housing. Yeah, so I, I, I would like to add one to D as you're as you're finishing there and you're typing. Um, you know, I want to I want to dovetail on what Emily said because we talk about the growth in Nashville. I think it's the resistance to growth, right? And because of that, we're not able to have a conversation about smart growth and develop strategies for the challenges that come along with the amount of of, of um, 
the influx of, of residents and that we have in our city. And so as we resist growth, we don't embrace it and we don't have a really strong and valuable conversation about it. Uh, Council Member Suar, I see you are, you're now able to raise your hand. Happy to address yes. you. Yes, <laughs> and I can hear you all better. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna piggyback on the growth as well, um, but on the other side of what Edward is saying is that what we're seeing that is adding to this is the fact that we have outside investors people from across the country that have money that will pay cash, uh, that what I would consider expensive is not expensive to them. And they're taking up the market and that is the other side of that growth that we're seeing that is creating, uh, uh, it's a seller's market now. And so the cost of housing is going up rapidly and it's becoming more and more afford unaffordable for people that actually reside here. Alrighty, so are there any positive aspects uh, behind these data that we should be considering that help tell the story about these data? Looking for hands. I see a council member, so your hand is still up. I don't know if you wanted to weigh in. Um, if if not, I think I think there is. We talk about the amount of money and the dollars that are coming. I think again, it, it's it's our responsibility as a city and as and as representatives of the city to to steward those dollars. And so, when you have a lot of attention and you have a lot of a lot of demand for what you have to offer, um, you have to be you have to be creative in how you do that and make sure you're doing it responsibly. Uh, Kia, I see I see your hand went up. Yeah, on the community side, um, the positive story is that native Nashvillians want to stay in Nashville. Um, they don't want to be pushed to the outskirts. Um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness or experiencing an aging in place or mental health, uh, health crisis, they also want to live comfortably. Um, so people want to stay right here. They don't want to live um, transiently or they don't want to have to be pushed out into other counties. So I think that's a positive story is that people want to stay and we just have to create a place and a way for them to stay. Thank you, Kia. Um, let's see, Dr. Coleman, I still, I see your hand. I don't want to ignore it if it's meant to be up. For some reason, I can't find the lower your hand. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries at all. I think with that, what I'd like to do is move to our next question, which is, if we do nothing, what will this look like in the future? What will Nashville look like? Where does the story behind the data take Nashville? I see, I see, I see Gina's hand. I think she was ready for this question. <laughs> I think it's just going to become a very different city. Um, you know, I think what's great, what makes great cities is there's a really great mix of different incomes, different, uh, you know, groups of individuals, and if we make it so only a certain income bracket and a certain socioeconomic status can only live here, I think it's going to lose a lot of vibrancy as a city. You've kind of seen that in some parts of town already. Um, in particular, where I live, um, what's happened in this neighborhood when I moved here to now, it's almost a completely different place. Um, not necessarily bad, but, but I think it definitely lost some opportunity. We've got a we've got a few hands here. Um, I'll go Dr. Coleman, and then after you, I see I see Kia. Yes, uh, if we can imagine the entire city being gentrified. That's what is going to happen, and it will squeeze out uh, more working class people and perhaps our artisan and uh, artistic and craftspeople uh, segment. Uh, it will probably become primarily a higher income, well-educated, and increasingly white. So Kia and, and uh, Council Member Suar. Yeah, I'll just jump in. Um, I always feel an honored to go behind Dr. Coleman because she always says what's in my brain. Um, but we will become the city that um, the world thinks that we already are. Um, so when I travel and people say, you know, where are you going? I said, I'm going home to Nashville. And they say, no, where are you going after that? And so and we have television shows and we have PR campaigns showing um, a, a very specific Nashville. What will happen is that if we keep going this way, we look 
the way that the world um, thinks that we already are. <laughs> All right, that resonates with me. Um, Councilmember Suar, would you go ahead? And after that, I see uh, Gina. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, what we're not thinking about is that if we don't do anything, it would actually cost us more. There's a lot of data that shows that if we don't house our people, we spend more money on hospitals, we spend more money on cares, we spend money on homelessness. So the cost is actually going to be greater than what we think it will be. So spending the money on the front end, it's not only save our citizens, but it also saves our budget. And so we have to look at it from that angle as well. No, that's great. Uh, Gina, would you go ahead and then um, I see Beth and then Kelsa. I think we'll start having real problems with having a true workforce if we don't do something about it. Short and sweet. Beth, would you go ahead? More homelessness. Mm -hmm. Kelsey? I think to Gina's point, um, recruitment and retention is going to continue to to be an increasing um, problem. And I think we're also going to start to see a lot more strain on our infrastructure, especially transit and transportation. Um, people are already upset about traffic, and it's just going to continue to get worse if if more people are forced to move outside of the county. No, so I think a very a very critical um challenge that will come from this dia is a, a, a restlessness and a resentment right from our from our current population right so we we are talking about how this impacts people and i think that's the most critical thing is the the aspect of our our, our society right we'll be we'll become one that is while it's already some tense areas and tense topics i think we'll become one that is even more more so um strained in a lot of different ways Good deal. Um, lots to say here. Um, I think what I'd like to do is we talked about several programs. Our next questions are really about what programs contribute to creation. I think that's a good pivot here. Um, and we've listed here several of those programs. Um, and I'm going to pull them down, put them here. Um, Again, we have several more questions to move through. Um, so if we don't get all the programs that are contributing to the story and creating units, we can, we can always go back. But just a quick look, are there other programs that we wanna add to this story that's working, that are working to create units? Okay. See, I see a few hands. So they, they, oh, my okay. screen. Yeah, I apologize. My screen was was delayed. Um, I see uh, Dwayne. If you'd go ahead, and then after Dwayne, um, I see Emil. I think it would be helpful to add uh, funding programs, and then add all of those. Uh, in one sort of category where we're talking about federal programs like low income housing tax credits and then local programs like uh, the Barnes fund and pilot. You could also add uh, housing uh, assistance. Uh, contracts for uh, multifamily that I think add significantly to uh, the the, the ability to finance uh, residential uh, units. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, Mel, would you go ahead? This could be listed under federal programs, but I would include the home investment partnership. I see and then council member Suar. Yeah, I was going to put the community land bank and specifically the um, uh, selling of uh, excess uh, lots off the tax rolls that MDHA has done and that Woodbine has used a lot of to create affordable housing and other nonprofits. 
Thanks, Hunter. Um, Council Member Suara, and then I also see Kelsey. Um, Metro has a, a, a program, um, not a lot, but uh, called the uh, EHIPP. I'm trying to remember what what the acronym stands for, uh, but that is HI. And that is a credit program that we use to reimburse uh, a landlord for taking less than um, the, the market rate. And, and that's, uh, that's a program that we have as well. Would you go ahead, Kelsey, and then I see Mick. Um, under federal programs, I would add the National Housing Trust Fund grants and the Tennessee Housing Trust Fund. Um, and then one non-funding related, um, the uh, prioritization or fast tracking of permitting for affordable housing. Yeah, great. And and if you just want to make if you want to make the note, um, the uh, HIP is, is it's housing incentive pilot program. If you wanted to make the note, and then Mick, I, you've got the mic after that. Um, yeah, I was uh, Kelsey. Took, oh, and I was going to say the the Tennessee Housing Trust Fund as as another as another source. Uh, but that's all I was going to add. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think so we want to, uh, Dia, yes. if we can add one last one, we also use the uh, tax increment financing as another tool. When you're still, you're still unmuted. Did you have something you were going to add or respond to, or is that just, okay, he's muted now. All right. Okay. So let's keep working through this. Um, you know, earlier Beth mentioned um, we really need to better understand um, what the forecast on subsidies look like. Um, for um, I, I believe it was below sixty percent AMI. Just at all the levels. Is there any other data or research, um, evidence-based research that folks want to add right now that comes to the top of their their mind right now? Mick, do you, you have your hand up? Didn't know if you wanted to chime in. Uh, I, I did, but I had actually left my hand up from before. But I actually think a really important part of the story that we're, we're figuring out is uh, the cost of construction. And so, you know, part of what's, what's causing this uh, crunch, as other people have mentioned, is the, just the, the straight up cost costs about $200,000 to build a multifamily unit or more. Uh, and uh, getting to the expense of that will also help us address, okay, what are the resources we need to get it to the, the, to the price point which people are to. Great. Uh, Kia, I see your hand, and then I see Gina's hand. Yeah, I think um, Diaz probably heard me say this a time or two, and Edward probably as well. The greatest data um, is people, and so we create these um, plans and we create these recommendations. And it's really important that we don't uh, just assess our own need, but based on what we think. But we really go back and um, at the end of this, make sure that we've heard from people that this is what they actually need, and not just that we're the representative voice for what we believe they need. That's how we get this cycle of um, wealth gap and um, the, the system of racism happens over and over again because we sit here and make these decisions. So that's the biggest data point I want to bring to this. I'd like to just highlight Kia's point here. I think this is an excellent point, uh, which is really uh, the story of lived experience and insight and expertise. And um, you know, um, lots of projects when there's not sufficient quantitative data to explain that, they absolutely create uh, their own metrics for that. And so uh, I'm glad to have Kia on board because uh, that's one of Kia's great genius. And so Kia, I'm going to assign you <laughs> <laughs> to come back to us with what might be ways we can supplement our work um, with the voice of Nashvilleans. Okay. 
I I do have I do have Gina's hand and then I have Kelsey's hand up. Yep. I uh, I sit on a nonprofit board that runs some affordable housing um, in town, and we actually met today looking at our budget and between just two things in particular, the property taxes that are coming next year and, you know, the rising cost of water, you know, there was a kind of a list of things. We calculated out that their costs went up 8% and they had decided to put a cap on raising rents because of COVID didn't want to increase that as it was. A lot of their residents are Hispanic who do not have the ability to get a lot of assistance from some of the programs that are out there. So I think maybe understanding some data around that, the cost of increased just, you know, we talked about construction, but the general cost of maintaining and, you know, making the project, uh, you know, run year to year um, and then stay afloat. So it's, it's a big discussion we had today. Go ahead, Kelsey. Um, so we use the kind of 30% rule when we talk about affordability that it shouldn't cost more than 30% of somebody's income. And I would love to have more information and just an analysis of how appropriate that 30% rule actually is, um, whether or not it factors in all of the other expenses that folks are dealing with. Um, so whether there's a more appropriate kind of benchmark for us to use. Um, and then a look at all the metro owned land um, and whether or not any of that would be appropriate for development. Hunter, I see your, I see your hands went up. Yeah, Kelsey, that was, a, that was a great point, was when we define affordability, we talk about um, the old 30% uh, income rule for housing and whether or not that's a uh, measure of affordability or not, or, or how big is the actual like uh, quote unquote cost burden for people, because uh, it's a pretty hard stop at 60%. The Joint Center for uh, Housing Studies at Harvard has a great uh, white paper on and the applicability of the 30%. Kelsey, that I'll, I'll shoot you after this. Do you so, send that was a great point. Yep, get it. feel free um, to get it out to the full um, committee as well, and we will be sure to um, archive that. And I, I have I have one idea that I'm I'm not quite sure how to articulate, but I'll try not to stumble to through it too much. Um, zoning zoning request um, as it relates to um, upzoning of smaller parcels. So, I guess my question is more housing creation at a micro scale versus a macro scale. So how do we tackle the problem by creating two and three and four and five um, housing units across the board, um, across the, the county or the city versus the kind of one or two big projects and try to tackle them by the, by the you know, dozens or hundreds. Um, and I think that's also an enabling um, factor, right? We have a lot of developers and a lot of institutions that would like to do more housing development, particularly for affordability, um, and for affordability as a focus, but they they don't have the resources to go and take on large land acquisitions, but they do have smaller properties that they can, they can um, offer up to the cause. I see uh, council member Suarez uh, is gone up. I just want to ask if we have the data on where uh, what the people are seeing uh, all over the county. And I said this because one of the things that I'm hoping by the time we're done with this project, uh, which has been a concern for some part of Nashville, is that it's concentrated in more areas than others. And so knowing where everything is uh, would be great so that at the end of the day, we can make sure that our conversation and, the, uh, and what we're trying to build is not just in one part of the city uh, uh, to avoid concentrated poverty. So uh, having that data of where I'll see now right now, of where the land is, allow us to make sure that we have it throughout the city and not just in North or Southeast or in certain part of the city. So, uh, I don't know if we have that, that data, but that would be a good data to have. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really, those are really good data points, whether it, I think you're typing the density of affordable properties. I also think about um, average home price and average rental rates by, by zip code is probably another good one that we can access. 
Um, Key, I see your I see your hand. I just wanted to add um, this. Uh, the gentleman who mentioned the Harvard study, I think, reminded me of this. Are there other markets that are doing um, this work? Um, or who have done this really well, not necessarily for us to use them. I, I like to use the best practice just as foundational. We can create our own best outcome, but are there best practices other places just in uh, case study review? And I think that may be coming up in the next few weeks, but I just wanted to put that on the table to say it'd be great to see what other markets have done or what they've done really wrong um, as well as what they've done really well. No, that's great. Dr. Dr. Coleman, I see your hands up. Dr. Coleman, did you mean to have your hand up? Yes, it would be good to have the data by zip code, but it would also be very helpful to have it by councilmatic district. Gotcha. Okay, that is a wonderful list of research and data. And we will continue this as we move forward. Um, we need to move to our next question which is who are partners that can help us change this data story? As you peruse the list of uh, the membership roster for the Affordable Housing Task Force, who else do we need at the table to help us begin to create Nashville's own best practices? I certainly think uh, faith based communities, because many of them own properties and some of them are involved and have their own community development corporations. Much agreed. I don't see I don't see other hands up uh, up Kelsey. Um, I think major employers, um, if we're talking about wages as a factor. Um, and also folks in the construction industry who are, um, you know, dealing with and, and seeing those increased costs firsthand. Hunter, I see your hands up. Yeah, with uh, us mentioning federal programs in the LIHTC, um, all of that equity comes from uh, pretty much the largest banks that are located here. And as well as Emily mentioned, uh, the CITC, which is all funded by uh, banks, and so they end up being the ones that uh, play the largest part and have the largest checks to write for affordable housing in the city. Mm -hmm. Emily, I see, I see your hand is up, and then after that, Kelsey. Um, yeah, I think that there are some. We have a paucity of national partners contributing in Nashville, so whether that's your big foundations or whether that's, you know, much larger investments from banks on the CRA side, or um, also, you know, thinking about things like list and enterprise, like groups that typically have offices in cities like ours and are bringing those resources there to create, um, you know, acquisition funds and those kinds of things. With that, Emily, do you do you think that there are social in, there are social impact fund type of organizations as well? Yeah, that's like the list of enterprises a good example of that. But you can make it a broader category as. Yeah. Um, Kelsey, I see your hand is up. To Kia's point earlier about this all being about people. Um, actual residents of affordable housing um, who bring that lived experience and perspective about, um, you know, what's missing and, and how we can do this work better. Dr. Coleman, I see your hand is up. Yeah. Um, a group that's absent and um, intentionally absent, unlike in other cities where the philanthropic community plays a great role, there has been a reluctance um, from, uh, from the major philanthropies here in Nashville to be engaged or to prioritize funding for affordable housing. Good deal. I think that's a great list. Edward, do you see any other hands up? 
Um, I see I see Emil's hand just went up and Emily, but her hand may have just been left up. Yeah, so just Emil. Go ahead, Emil. Okay. Two quick um, organizations. The first is the Tennessee Fair Housing Council as we think about solutions to barrier and barriers to, to fair housing. And another organization is, I'm sorry, not organization, but state legislators. Um, not only here in, in Nashville, but maybe some in the surrounding counties, because as housing affordability challenges increase in Nashville, it'll have an impact on us. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at our final set of questions. Uh, this is really about, if we think back to the data that we looked at tonight, about how would we turn the curve? Uh, you know, I always think about that forecast on subsidized housing. That is that if we did nothing, you know, if, if credits weren't um, extended, if, um, you know, affordability wasn't renewed, you would just see this decline in available units, even as there's just an increased pressure given where the job market is going. Uh, for affordable housing. So the real question is, what can we do to make market rate affordable? Um, so as we thought through some of the questions earlier, what should we have in your mind about this? What would work to turn that curve? Hmm. Um, Emil, I see your hand. I'm not sure if that was just still up from last time. I think it was. I'm, and I don't I don't see hands right now. Uh, Dr. Coleman, did you want to did you want to speak? If I understand, you're asking what what needs to happen to turn the curve. I think some policies that would require affordable affordable housing to be included in uh, before permits and things of that nature were or allowed. The big problem is we don't have a comprehensive approach to addressing the affordable housing crisis. So therefore, it's, it's difficult for us to come up with policies that would facilitate the creation of more affordable housing. I see uh, Gina's hand and then Council Member Suarez. <clears throat> Two things. Um, one, um, I agree with Dr. Coleman is, and Kay mentioned it in one of our earlier meetings, just a dedication to have a comprehensive policy and have an office of affordable housing or have an office that's really going to be dedicated to these issues all the time. We, we don't have that. Um, and the second portion is I, I do think zoning and density. You talked a little bit about it earlier, Ed, with the single family zoning and sort of how you can fill neighborhoods that works toward preservation and creation. And so I think, you know, again, I know I keep saying zoning, but I do think looking at what can be done in that. Um, there's a there's a chart, a website that I sometimes look at. It's a group called Up for Growth, and they have these calculators for different cities, and they have like 10 different factors. They have, um, you know, are there regulations in place like parking? Are there historic overlays? Is there zoning? Are there jobs? I mean, they just have like 10 different things, all the things that would affect affordable housing. And you can kind of change them on the scale and then you can see what happens to the rents on the side. Uh, they told me they were working on one for Nashville, but they have one for Charlotte. They said that's probably the closest thing to look at now. So I just kind of messed around with it one day and kind of did that. And it really is interesting to see all the different pieces and what they affect um, to the bottom line at the end. So I think really something like that would be helpful. Yeah, so I would say I would say the uh, um, a, a database and a tool to evaluate um, what I would say is a coll collective impact of, of various things, of various uh, factors. I mean, hey, Edward, this is Hunter. Can I jump in there? Gina, are you talking about just like in the sense of like more supply will naturally drive down the um, the cost of housing? And so you're saying like more liberal zoning regarding housing in general? Yeah, like they'll have a section that says zoning, and they say, is there a historic overlay, which would, again, present density? Are there sort of onerous parking requirements that would make it harder to put more housing if you're on like a transit corridor or something like that? Is there transit? 
is there uh, are there um, long processes like permitting? You know, Kelsey, you sort of mentioned earlier the city will prioritize that if if that's a long process as well. Those are all the things that just make it harder to do it. And so I need to go back to it to look at what they have, but it's just pieces of this. Yeah, if you if you will, I'll send it out to everybody. Yeah, I was gonna say just share it so we can have it as a group resource. Uh, Council Member Suara and then um, Chi, I see your hand. Um, I think that the first thing that comes to mind is the uh, funding. Uh, there has to be money put to it. We talk, we have an affordable housing committee on the council, uh, but when we're talking about bonds from there's people that support and people that don't support it. And so you can have all the ideas, uh, the, the water thing that uh, Gina talked about, I'm working on that with the water department, but there's nothing they could do. We have to identify the money for it. And so something that we can do now is making sure that we put some funds in our body uh, And I think that's something we can do now. Uh, Kia, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I think um, I want to comment towards the comprehensive approach. I mentioned this in our first meeting. We often have these conversations in silos and, and I, I'm, I'm a heavy advocate of thinking about resilient communities. Um, and what does it take to be a healthy environment? And so I have a graphic that I you know I reference very often: um, responsible governance, quality of life, strong economy, and a prepared system. And in and, and all of that, a person we can't just think about a person's ability to live in a home, but then around them is a um, J Crew. Um, they also have to be able to afford so the affordable living, and not just affordable housing. They have to really be able to afford. The, um, the fullness of the community that they're a part of, and that means education and healthcare and workforce and transportation. It means all of those things. So I would like to see um, us turn the corner or, or, or um, turn the curve on talking about this just as an isolated issue. Um, I know we brought up workforce, but that is one component of a person's ability to thrive. If they can't get to work because we don't have access to great public transportation, um, or if they can't go to the doctor's office, um, without a great burden, they're not going to be able to um, live very long um, and let alone live in an affordable housing unit. So I really want us to think about the systems approach and system design to how this, and, and um, Edward just mentioned collective impact, really thinking how we can um, look at this public, private um, sectors and bringing this all together really to have a more resilient community. We lost our office of resilience and that is something that has been very harmful to a lot of our black and brown communities in Nashville. Thank you for that, Kia. Um, Tia, I don't I don't see many other hands up at the moment, but I do think another factor, I, I, I go back again to, you know, thinking about it from the social aspect, but um, an education and an acceptance, right? So we talk about having a leveling of the of, of uh, understanding and our collective uh, population really seeing that we have a, a crisis on our hands that we're working with. Um, I think I think that's really important. And then strategic density. I, I, you know, I'm a bit of a broken record, but macro as well as micro. Um, and you know, I think every community needs to consider density. I think it's just a strategy in, into what's right for which for what uh, areas along corridors or in certain communities. Very good. We are at our last question for this evening before we go into election of um, nomination of chair and vice chair. So how can we help the market better serve the non subsidized households at these lower levels of income and home value to take advantage of new units? All right, I don't see, I don't think I have a lag on my screen. I don't see any hands. Let's see. All right, Emily. I mean, I think ultimately we need to subsidize them, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just I don't think folks are gonna start doing this just out of the goodness of their heart because they inherently have to be for profit. But um yeah, I would say subsidizing them. So what kind of programs are folks thinking about? What is coming to mind about uh, a subsidized program that must be in the mix in the next one to three years. 
So there's legislation currently at the state to expand the pilot program. And um, I certainly hope that this task force is going to support that, you know, if that gets through that we do something on a local policy level to expand pilots, which has been, you know, a very successful program to date. Um, so that's one area. And then obviously I think it's about designing really effective programs on the funding side that is um, trying to be financially efficient but also recognizing that, you know, when we talk about impact, there's the financial impact and then there's the like impact. So, you know, when we're talking about our homeless population, impact, right? And that's a financial, that's a very financially efficient use of dollars for our city, um, even if it's an expensive price tag. Uh, Hunter, I saw your hand is up. Yeah, I was going to uh, echo what Emily said that like ultimately you have to subsidize that population uh, of or that that income level. I think at I think at like a 30% income uh, just with the current uh, current property taxes and just cost of operating an apartment complex, it's uh, it's just not financially feasible no matter what your return is. There's you're, you're not even break even before you pay any sort of uh, any sort of debt service. So just your operating call, just your operating costs are in the negative. Um, so I think that I think Emily hit on it, expand uh, the pilot program, and then and then two, it's um, it's trying to get the state to realize the um, the crisis that we're under. Um, truly, like I talk about all the time, we uh, we we argue over nickels at, at a local level when when the big dollars are at the state with THCA, and uh, and you know. THCA is not willing to commit um, uh, set aside specifically for Davidson County or even the Nashville MSA. And uh, that is the greatest opportunity there. They have 200 plus million dollars in tax credits that they allocate every year on the competitive basis. And Nashville won't get a single dollar this year. And so all that to say that, um, you know, we can argue over 5 million, 10 million, whatever we want the Barnes funds to be, it's never going to equal the amount of money that DHCA gets on an annual basis, just in their competitive program, not to mention in the non-competitive tax credit program. So. No, that's a great point, Hunter. Uh, Dr. Dr. Coleman. You're still on mute if you're talking, Dr. Coleman. When Hunter mentioned the state, I thought about the TANF funds, which are 740 something million dollars, and where other states have, and there are no federal prohibitions, as we have been able to discover, that prevent that money from being used for housing or affordable housing or uh, subsidies, et cetera. So, that is something that really needs to be explored. And we, we also know that uh, there are incredible tensions between uh, the state and our city, so. Mick, I see, I see your hand. Thanks, Ed. Um, you know, it's slightly up, up, uh, going up the income scale up to, you know, let's say about the, the 80 percent of AMI level. Um, I do think the current environment sets up a circumstance where home ownership, given the right supports, is a possibility uh, for people at the sort of 80 percent of AMI uh, level. It doesn't even need to be subsidized. So I just ran some quick numbers over here. You know, there are uh, condos uh, available for the $250,000 range. And with the current interest rates today, that translates to $1,100 a month uh, uh, housing payment. So if you're in that $50,000 a year range, um, which in, you know, is it for a family of four is, is, is uh, about what, that's actually about what 60% of AMI is in, in, in Davidson County right now. I think there's a possibility we can figure out ways to get more of those units for sale. It doesn't get to the deepest need at all, but it is an opportunity to relieve some of that pressure if we can figure out ways uh, to make that happen. So um, I just think that that home ownership, today's current interest rate environment, if we can put the appropriate supports there, uh, we can open up a, a level of supply that isn't 
available during uh, other uh, economic times. And so, and so, in response to that, Mick, does that somewhat align? I think with what what Emily is saying. You know, when you when you acquire those, you're still there, and there are programs in place, but you'll need down payment assistance if you do not have the funds for that. So there's a there's a hand in hand opportunity of do we commit dollars to help fund programs such as that increase home ownership that takes advantage of the unique opportunity present to, to, to us now with low interest rates. Yep. And, and THDA has those funds right now for down payment assistance, which isn't like an additional subsidy really, for, uh, I think in the way that they understand their, their, their books. Um, so they are, they're, those, those are, are, are available. Uh, I think they structure them as loans now, but they will help people households get into, uh, into homeownership. I think this is a great start um, with the list. Um, we are now at 16 minutes after the hour at 616. We've got, got two so, more hands. So I think council, okay, let's, let's yeah, take two more. Yeah, right? for council members who are. Uh, thank you. I just wanted us to add because all these uh, programs are great that we're talking about, but I think what we can do is make sure that people are aware of it. I think making sure that people, those services are available so they can apply for it is another way we can help uh, people in those households. So just getting the information out uh, is something that we can do. Absolutely. One of our one of our core tenants being access, and, and that that revolves around that. Dr. Dr. Coleman, I think you wanted to speak too before we move on. No, I'm I'm fine. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Well, well, Dia, I think we can I think we can move to the next the next stage of our meeting this evening. Is, is that where we go for our, our chair and vice chair votes? It's now time to turn our attention to the election of the committee chairships. Um, so uh, I think we've done some great work tonight. The chairships will be involved in helping to polish this up a little bit and bring it back to you all to to review, to make amendments, to prioritize. Uh, so we'll have a chance to do that in in uh, you know in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, but um, here's the deal with the chairships: is that the chair of the committee, uh, his or her role, will be to um, is is really around people. Uh, ensuring engagement in the committee, ensuring uh, that everybody has a chance to speak, understanding everybody's perspective, making sure everybody's perspective is represented in the work that we're doing moving forward to create uh, an action framework um, that really focuses on the next one to three years. Um, next, uh, the vice chair, her or his role will be um, really to focus on data and information. Um, and what that would look like is um, as we hone in on our task, really ensuring that we have the right data before us and that we're looking at good best practice research. Um, we heard from a couple of folks, you know, Kia mentioned this, what is working in other towns? Uh, we might not want to replicate it, but we might want to create our own Nashville model of that. So, um, so those are really the roles. Chair is around people, vice chair is around data information. Um, and uh, this is an opportunity to self nominate or to nominate one of your colleagues. So I'm going to stop sharing the information and I will be sure to send this out to you. So everybody has this rough draft as we move forward. Are there any nominations on the floor? I was getting ready to say we probably need to. Those are verbal, verbal nominations. <laughs> verbal nominations. It's true. And alas, as much as we enjoy Edwards' leadership, he cannot be a committee chair. Neither can Nick. <laughs> Dr. Coleman, were you were you pointing? <laughs> <laughs> I have to leave, so that's why, and I couldn't find the chat, so that's why. So, good luck, whoever the new people are, the leaders are. Should we make it the first person who leaves the meeting is the new chair? I was giving, I, was giving, I think we, we've got at least one nomination now. So, <laughs> um, Dia, if you don't mind, I would just like to. This is such a confident group of people. If there's anyone who's really has the bandwidth and is talking at the bit, I'd love to hear that first, rather than it feeling like you know we're 
recommending people and throwing them under the bus. <laughs> yes, please self-nominate. We're, we're not going to pick anyone. Um, I would be happy to dig into the data component. Okay, so Kelsey for vice chair. I have a limited schedule, very limited, but I'm happy to be the people part of this conversation if necessary, if no one else is available. I'm happy to keep us honest on the people side. Thank you, Kia. Well, that way I don't have to nominate you when you're not looking. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like a great slate to me. Yeah. Also, <laughs> also, please, please do note that while you while we said, you know, Mick and myself won't be able to be in these positions, we will continue to be support for these positions in both committees. So you will you will continue to have Mick and myself as well as the great work of Dia and John. Uh, supporting you in those roles. So thank you ladies for volunteering. Great. So, uh, you know, I did not hear any objections, but I, I assume we can just adopt this. And this is, these are your chairs and I will, I uh, guess. Welcome, welcome to the leadership team. Um, so I think with that, we land the plane eight minutes early today. Uh, I know it's been a long day for everyone, and I thank you all for your time. Uh, more work to do, so let's take advantage of these eight minutes. And uh, for those of you who have a long weekend, enjoy the weekend. Indeed, indeed. Thank you all again for your time this evening. Look forward to reconnecting soon. And congratulations, DL, your new appointment. Thank Indeed. you, Councilwoman Swara. Good night, all. Good night, everybody. Thanks so much for your time. Good night. It was great. Bye.